when that passenger airbag exploded, it basically degloved his entire face. He lost his nose, he lost his right eye. The type of catastrophic injuries that one is more accustomed to seeing in a Hollywood movie, not something from a device in an automobile that's supposed to protect you. In the entirety of my career, I don't think I've seen a larger global defect than the Takata airbag recall. It was something that most major automobile manufacturers kind of closed their eyes and crossed their fingers and really hoped that nothing bad would happen. Unfortunately, we started seeing death after death after death. People losing eyes, people with just disfiguring facial lacerations, extreme hearing loss. So you still have 40 million plus vehicles globally that are driving around with a potential ticking time bomb, a grenade in either their steering wheel or their dashboard. My name is Andrew Parker Felix. I'm a partner in the product liability department at Morgan & Morgan. And today I'm gonna to be speaking on a global product defect involving Takata airbags. I've been able to resolve over a hundred Takata airbag individual cases. And those settlement ranges have gone from half a million dollars all the way north of $15 million. I would suggest that these cases are extremely valuable. I had the absolute privilege of representing a just wonderful woman who had been unfairly injured by a Takata airbag. And it unfortunately gave her just disfiguring chest lacerations, uh, extreme hearing loss, and facial lacerations that no human being should ever have to experience. And she was the most patient, caring, and understanding person that I think I've been able to represent in the last 20 years. And fortunately, we were able to get her a multi-million dollar result, and it has been life-changing for her. Granted, the compensation that we were able to obtain for her doesn't reverse the injuries that she sustained because those are what I call and what John Morgan calls forever injuries. They're not going to go away. But what this does do is help her live with something that was unfairly inflicted upon her. You know, she was able to buy her first home. Uh, she's able to help her grandchildren out, something she was never able to do before uh, working at a pharmacy and, and janitor services. She is so grateful and so happy and thankful uh, and just gracious for the work that we did for her that she comes to my office every year. She gives me a hug. She texts me on my birthday. So it's those kind of moments uh, that make even the result seem secondary. It's the fact that I've been able to create a relationship with someone that will last hopefully the rest of our lives and also do something that was beneficial and positively impacts them as well and their family. Takata was a component manufacturer based in Japan. And basically, they were sourcing all of the airbags to every major automobile manufacturer in the world. Everyone from Honda and Toyota to Ferrari and Lotus. Most every automobile had an ammonium nitrate Takata airbag installed both on the driver's side and on the passenger side. The question kind of becomes, why did this defect happen? And instead of looking at Takata, I think we have to look at the automobile manufacturers, meaning what was their motive? Just why they were motivated to create a cheaper airbag alternative, albeit with disastrous results, they're also motivated to really minimize and make problems with their vehicles seem smaller. And why do they do that? Well, because it's cheaper. Each recall they don't have to issue saves them tens of millions of dollars. And as we all know, these are businesses and they're accountable to stockholders and their corporate boards. And the idea of let's protect our consumer, let's protect innocent people who are actually using their hard earned money to purchase these products, unfortunately falls to the bottom of the line, the back of the list, and it gets lost in translation. Putting profits over consumer safety. And a number of the major automobile manufacturers approached Takata. They said, we need a cheaper product. So Takata suggested, why don't we use ammonium nitrate as the propellant? This isn't something that's singularly isolated in the United States or in Europe. It affects cars everywhere. Uh, as we said, there are 40 plus million vehicles that are still impacted by this lethal defect. This defect is a global problem. 
And it's not a past global problem, it's an ongoing global problem. And it's been exacerbated by the fact that certain auto manufacturers delayed their recalls. And one would ask, why did they do that? Well, because federal regulated recalls are very expensive. So car manufacturers go, well, let's just send some letters out. Let's do the bare minimum to see what we can do and just hope this problem isn't as bad as everybody else thinks it is. And that's what's really added to the explosive phenomenon of what's transpired here. Uh, this doesn't just impact a certain line of Honda Accords. It's everything from a Toyota Corolla uh, to a Tesla. And it's model year vehicles that run from 2000 all the way up to 2014. And this recall list isn't static, meaning that it is ever evolving. We're constantly adding tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of vehicles to this recall uh, that have contributed and that will continue to injure and unfortunately kill innocent consumers. This is something where I feel our expertise really comes into play. We immediately have an investigative team that can analyze both the physical evidence of the vehicle and the injuries themselves to determine whether or not this has been what's called a rupture of the airbag inflator. And by rupture, I mean where that metal canister has essentially exploded and it shoots hot, jagged metal fragments through that airbag cushion at the driver and at the passenger. And this isn't just a small event. This is a grenade going off in your face at about 400 miles an hour with metal shrapnel and other projectiles that will just completely disfigure a human body. Notwithstanding the fact this isn't a small noise, this is a massive explosion that is happening within the confines of your car. So when we look to what injuries have, may have transpired from a defective Takata airbag, we generally see uh, loss of vision in an eye or we see facial lacerations. Uh, we also see hearing loss. A lot of times it's very jagged lacerations and, and just things that don't look like they would have happened in a normal car crash. Uh, we also look for holes or tears in the airbag's fabric to confirm that those metal shrapnel pieces have come through the airbag cushion. Well, I would start with saying that each case is different. But what I can tell you is that there are a number of funds that have been established to help compensate injured Takata airbag victims. There is a trust fund that I sit as a member of that advocates for the rights of injured plaintiffs. There is also a criminal restitution fund that was established as a result of Takata's bankruptcy that injured victims may make a claim to. Now, in addition to that, the automobile manufacturers, such as Honda or Ford, Mercedes, may also be liable for the injuries that anyone sustains as a result of this car company basically choosing to put this deadly product in their car and then sell it to consumers. When we determine value of a case, many factors go into it. Uh, economic losses, what the pain and suffering is like, the permanency and foreverness of these injuries that these individuals have sustained. These can be multi-million dollar claims with really no limit on what they can be worth because this is an injury that never should have transpired. This is an event that we even shouldn't be talking about here today. And unfortunately, 20 years later, we're still talking about the lethal results that could have been prevented a long time ago. When we're focusing on Takata airbags, I think it's very important to remember we're not just focused on Takata. Takata is now a bankrupt entity. And while there is a trust fund, there are other entities and individuals that are likewise liable for what went wrong here. So when we're looking at who else is responsible for this deadly defect, I look at the car dealerships who sold the car originally. I look at any dealership or other entity that has serviced the car why that recall was outstanding. I look at an individual who potentially sold the car, even if it was used. So there are a number of other avenues, excluding Takata, who we can bring into this process to hold accountable uh, for the life-changing injuries that people suffer from this defect. So a used car dealership uh, can absolutely be liable uh, for a Takata airbag defect, contingent on what venue I decide to bring the case in. You know, each state has separate rules 
uh, innocent seller statutes, et cetera. So it's a case-by-case -case determination as to whether or not we are able to make a claim against that particular used car dealership for the Takata airbag defect. The Takata Airbag Tort Compensation Trust Fund was created to manage the claims of injured victims. The process also provided for the ability for a victim to opt out or otherwise receive their award from the trust fund and make a determination as to whether or not they thought that was sufficient. I have the privilege of currently representing a gentleman named Jose Hernandez in Miami, Florida, who went through the entire trust claim process. And at the end, we made a joint determination that that evaluation and award wasn't sufficient for the injuries that he sustained and continues to deal with. As such, we notified the trust that we are opting out of the trust fund process, and we have filed a lawsuit in Miami-Dade State Court. So this basically allows the claimants access to the jury system. While they have to participate in the trust process initially, they ultimately make the determination as to whether or not this award was adequate. And here, despite the trust functioning perfectly well and as it's designed, we believe that Mr. Hernandez uh, would like his day in court, and that's the process that we've taken. During the pendency of the Takata United States bankruptcy, uh, Judge Shannon appointed what was called a unsecured creditors committee for tort victims. And what that means is basically we had a separate committee that was able to represent the rights of injured victims during the bankruptcy. Uh, we argued that it was inequitable for injured victims to sit on the same creditors committee as the auto manufacturers who voluntarily did business with this criminal entity. And it was the first time in an automotive bankruptcy that a second unsecured creditors committee was established to protect victims' rights. Uh, Takata's bankruptcy in the United States is now closed, and as a result of that victims committee that I was appointed to sit as a member on, I now am appointed as a member of the trust advisory committee uh, to protect and advocate for victims' rights on the Takata Airbag Tort Compensation Trust Fund, which is still active today. Ammonium nitrate is a chemical used in mining explosions and, and demolition equipment. It's a very volatile, explosive chemical. Why it was attractive to be used as the propellant in these new airbags was because it was so much cheaper than guanidine nitrate, which was the industry standard before this. And it ended up being, on average, about $2 cheaper per inflator. So this was something what we've seen time and time again, not just in the automobile industry, but across all of corporate products. How do we make it cheaper? How do we increase our bottom line? And unfortunately, the desire to really bolster corporate profits and bolster the bottom line for these major OEMs took priority over how do we protect our consumers, which should always be the number one goal of any company. And that's how the fatal flaw first started here. And one of the outlying problems was Takata did not have the ability to then start producing alternate inflators. And the suggestion from the automobile companies is, well, don't drive your car. Well, that sounds very simple, but how does that work for someone who's a single mom and needs to take their children to school? Or anyone that just needs to get to their job? They purchased that car for a particular reason. And now the answer is, well, just don't drive it because we made a massive, horrendous decision to do business with a company that created a deadly product. So what we have uh, in front of me right now is two airbag inflators. And essentially this is a cross section of a passenger side uh, Takata ammonium nitrate airbag inflator. And to give you a little context, uh, the ammonium nitrate wafers uh, sit within this little compartment right here. And essentially when the vehicle gives a signal for the airbag to deploy, these wafers are ignited and a spark is given. And these wafers essentially combust into a gas. And all of this is happening in milliseconds. And essentially that gas then inflates the airbag when it works properly. The problem with the Takata airbag defect is ammonium nitrate is such a volatile and explosive chemical that it can morph and degrade into other parts of the airbag inflator where it's not supposed to be. 
So essentially, when you have a deployment event, this airbag inflator experiences a much higher pressurization than it was designed to withstand. So when that deploy signal completes, instead of the bag inflating safely the way that it's supposed to, it essentially blows this entire inflator mod module apart. And this inflator module is not light, it's not small. This is a few pounds here. And you can just picture jagged pieces of shrapnel coming through your airbag cushion at 400 plus miles an hour and striking you in the face and head. Now also next to me is an example of a driver side inflator. And essentially, the propellant wafers are housed in this compartment right here. And it's the same concept. When a deployment event is called for, those wafers are ignited and it is supposed to safely inflate that airbag cushion, allowing the driver of that vehicle to have a survivable event. Yet, when ammonium nitrate is used and you have an overpressurization event, two things happen. Either that metal shrapnel is going to shoot through the airbag cushion and injure and or kill the driver or passenger, or alternatively, it's going to create such an excess pressure that is going to inflate the airbag harder than it's designed to. And it's what we call an over-aggressive deployment, uh, meaning, and that can cause additional injuries even though there hasn't been a rupture event. In fact, there was a Honda case uh, called Patricia Mincy in which the airbag deployed in such an aggressive manner that it rendered her, unfortunately, a quadriplegic. So these are not small defects and they are not cases that should be looked over. Uh, they're existing in your inventory and they are cases that we can send you significant referral fee checks on. Morgan & Morgan has not just a national but a global reach in terms of handling and prosecuting cases. Within the product liability group, I have a team of former law enforcement that has investigated crashes uh, that can give us an initial opinion on what went wrong and why it went wrong. Uh, notwithstanding the team of lawyers that we have collected that focus only on product liability day in and day out. This is the only type of case that I work on, is the type of cases I specialize in, and this is why we are the right firm to send these cases to. We've been able to resolve over 100 individual Takata airbag cases from anywhere from half a million dollars to north of $15 million. And these are real settlement values from a referral fee perspective. I've been able to send six and seven figure referral fee checks to our referral partner network just for sending me an email consisting of, hey, can you give this a look? What do you think? These cases are currently in your automobile inventory and in your personal in injury inventory. They will also be in your future case looks as well. So it is definitely worth your time to give it a second look. Lawyers should be on the lookout for injuries that just don't seem commonplace in a general car crash, meaning facial lacerations, torso lacerations, vision loss, hearing loss, the type of injuries that you're just not expecting uh, in a prototypical type automobile collision. Uh, concurrently, there's generally a tattered or torn airbag cushion, meaning the fabric that contains the airbag, or there are holes in it to indicate that shrapnel or other projectiles have come through it. But in short, before you get too in the weeds as to what may or may not be a case, I'd humbly suggest you send them all to me for to look at because it won't cost you anything for me to give you an initial opinion as to whether or not we have a viable case here that we can pursue on your client's behalf. There is also a website that's operated uh, by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and it's nhtsa.gov, n-h-t-s-a.gov. And essentially you can visit that website and put in that particular vehicle's 17 digit vehicle identification number. And when you pull up that particular vehicle, it will show you what current and outstanding recalls uh, exist for that Honda Accord or for that Toyota. And it will allow you to better understand uh, that this could be a viable case. You know, as we said earlier, this is a global problem and it's something that your firms and my firm can work together on to solve.